I'm going to ask you to pray with me again and to say with your hearts what I'm saying with my mouth now. Lord, I ask that you would show us your glory and that you would glorify your son. Amen. I want to start with two stories. Both of them are true stories. The first takes place in the year 1542, and it's about a young woman named Magdalena Luther, who was the 13-year-old daughter of the great reformer. She fell ill with a serious sickness, and after a long struggle, she died in her father's arms. Shortly afterward, Luther wrote the following to his friend, Justice Jonas. Although my wife and I ought to rejoice because of her happy end, Magdalena was a believer. Yet such is the strength of natural affection that we cannot think of it without sobs and groans which tear the heart apart. The memory of her face, her words, her expressions in life and death, everything about our most obedient and loving daughter lingers in our hearts so that even the death of Christ and what are all deaths compared to his is almost powerless to lift our minds above our loss. So would you, my friend, give thanks to God on our behalf. In 2001, my grandfather, George Flatt, on my father's side, lay dying in a nursing home. He was born in 1907, totally different world. Um, but I loved him, I loved him. I didn't know him many years, but I loved him, and he loved me. We couldn't communicate very easily because his native language was German, and mine uh, was not. But we could communicate the things that matter. There was one time I remember when I was a boy, uh, he looked at me and he asked through my parents who were interpreting, are you gonna be a minister? when you grow up? And I said, yes, Opa, prime minister. <laughs> he liked that, he smiled, you could see all three of his teeth. <laughs> we loved each other, and even though we couldn't always understand each other, I was devoted to him. And when he lay dying, he, he suffered through enormous losses. He had suffered through a world war, being wounded in battle, one of his thumbs was missing because it was shot off. He was actually also missing the other thumb, which had got caught in some machinery. Um, he had suffered incredible things. He had lived for several years in a Russian prisoner of war camp in Siberia, was separated from his family, with whom, thanks be to God, he was later reunited. He was married to my grandmother for 65 years. When you're married that long in Ontario, where I'm from, the government sends you a plaque just out of sheer surprise <laughs> that anyone has accomplished such a thing. But after 65 years of marriage, my grandmother passed away and he was alone. And it was clear that life had lost its savor for him with her departure. And I remember visiting him in this nursing home with my mother, uh, hoping that I could bring him some comfort of some kind. And all that I can remember is that he lay there looking not at us, but at the ceiling, saying quietly over and over and over again in German, my savior, my savior, my savior, because that's who he wanted. And at the time I remember thinking very foolishly, I was very young, isn't our presence, isn't the fact that we, your family, are here, isn't it enough for you to rest on in the midst of this grief? It was not. These two stories illustrate both the difficulty of seeing past our profound emotions when we're grieving to gaze upon Christ and also our desperate need for his presence. Grief nearly shuts everything else out. And yet the only one whose presence we truly desire is Christ's. 
This is what it means to struggle with loss as a Christian. That's my theme tonight from the scriptures. We're gonna look at John chapter 11, part of it at least, about Lazarus in a few moments. I'm gonna paraphrase most of the story for the sake of time, and I think many of you know it. One way for you to think about what I'm trying to communicate to you is to think of Martha and Mary. Both Martha and Mary in this story in John 11. They say to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. We understand the world of grief tied up in those words. And yet Martha also says to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ. And as we experience loss as Christians, we experience both of these things, sometimes in the same moment. The story in John 11 is a call to courage in the midst of our pain. Loss is the central defining characteristic of human life in a fallen world. It's a monster which menaces us with many heads. The loss of relationships, the loss of health and strength, the loss of reputation and honor, the loss of place and a sense of home, the loss of our courage and our confidence, the loss of our peace, the loss of physical comforts, the loss of opportunities to do good while we are here on earth, the loss of our sense of purpose and of mission. To experience many of these things, all you have to do is live long enough. That's it. That's how deeply embedded in our experience of the world every part of our experience of the world, loss is. Death, however, stands above all other kinds of loss. It is the chief of a vast army of sorrows. It's what the book of Job calls the king of terrors. It's what one theologian has called the supreme and irrevocable disaster. What is death? Death is a curse. Genesis 3, verse 19, at the end of God's terrible sentence, at the climax of Adam's punishment, he says this, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. I know that you know, you all here, you know something about this. I know that the cumulative weight of loss represented in this room of all the kinds that I've mentioned, is staggering. I would not dare even to speak on this subject on my own authority to people who have lost as you have lost. Speaking just of bereavement to put aside all other losses. I happen to know that some of you have very recently lost your grandparents, parents, siblings, and some of you friends as well. Some of you have endured those losses this semester. I know because I get those emails. I get those emails from you. I have been struck even this semester by the unusual number of losses at Boyce College. So this is a lesson that you need. It's a lesson that I need. It's a lesson that everybody living on this planet needs. I also know that you guys are very young not that I'm all that much ahead of you, but we, we are young. Many of these forms of loss are actually only going to become apparent to you with the lapse of years. You don't know them yet, intimately. But you will. You will know them. And when the time comes for you to walk through them, I want you to be ready. There's a sense in which you never can be ready, right? I'm the kind of person who is absolutely useless in a moment of crisis. My wife right there can testify to this. On our wedding night at four in the morning in the building where we were staying for our honeymoon, all of the fire alarms in the building went off simultaneously. <laughs> she had the keys for the car, my shoes, and my clothes ready for me while I was running around in circles trying to decide what to do. 
she's the kind of person you want to be the mother of your children. <laughs> uh, and I'm just, I'm trying to learn. I talked one time to Dr. Solomon about this. You guys know Dr. Solomon? Dr. Solomon's an amazing guy. I look up to him. I look up to him literally and figuratively. Was, you know, he was in the military. And I came up to him one time and I said, I'm rubbish at this. Like, I don't know how to react in a crisis. Is there like a way that they teach you? You know, is there like a breathing exercise or something I could do? And he said, you know, you know what it is? You know how we train people for war? It's just endless repetition of the, of the training, the basic training for what your job is. You just do it over and over and over again so that you can do it while bombs are going off all around you. You cannot prepare, I think, adequately for the emotional impact of loss, especially bereavement, but I think there is a kind of training that you can undergo that will enable you, when loss is exploding around you and deafening your ears and blinding your sight, to hold on what matters most. So let's train together from John 11. Here's the context of this passage, okay? This is the seventh and final big sign of the book of John. John gives us big signs so that we may believe that Christ was sent by God for our redemption. Up until this point in the story of this gospel, Jesus has been the bread of life, the water of life, in the light of life, here he is life itself in the most magnificent way. Here's the story. Some of you know it, most of you know it perhaps. Jesus is with his disciples. Messenger comes from a beloved family, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Lazarus, their siblings. They've had previous interactions in the Gospel of John. And a message comes to Jesus that says, the one you love is ill, Lazarus. Jesus stays two more days, crucially, where he is with his disciples. He has a conversation with his disciples about going back to Judea. They say, you're crazy to go back to Judea. Jesus says, I'm paraphrasing, there's work for us to do there. There's work for me to do there. Goes down to Bethany, just south of Jerusalem, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus live. First he meets Martha, Martha, who's always busy, always a little bit stressed out. He has an important interaction with Martha that I'll refer back to in a moment. And then finally, Mary comes out with some other Jews who've come out from Jerusalem to mourn with her, and they have this encounter. This is in verse 32. And I'm reading the ESV with an adjustment. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was indignant in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Skip a couple verses down. Then Jesus, again indignant, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. 
We could spend years meditating on this chapter, and you should. But for tonight, I just want to focus on one thing. Jesus' emotions, to which the text repeatedly calls our attention. There's implications for us in what he feels. One of the ways we know this is from Lazarus himself. Not only is he a man, a human being like us, his name, really, in Hebrew, was Eliezer, of which Lazarus is an abbreviation, which means, get this, he whom God has helped. Could you imagine a more appropriate name for this man and his life story? It's not just about Lazarus, in other words. It's about us. It's about us whom God has helped. Often when we talk about this passage, we focus on Jesus' weeping. And I think that's right. The commentator in the Geneva Bible, that venerable old book, which was a lifeline to so many of our ancestors in the faith, the note simply says this about Jesus' weeping. These affections are proper to man's nature. Isn't that great? This is how a human being should feel. And Jesus is a human being. They're appropriate to man's nature, which he took up in his divinity. But what are the other emotions on display here? The ESV says he was deeply moved in verse 38. And I'm not going to quarrel with the translators here. I know how difficult translation is. They have a difficult job. Deeply moved is an attempt to accommodate some ambiguity. The word means feeling intensely inside. And it is almost always associated in the Greek literature of all periods with anger and indignation. So what does that mean in this context? Translators of English versions and versions in every language try to find a way to fudge it a little bit to leave some space for us to think this through, which is the appropriate thing to do. They say deeply moved with emotion. With what emotion? There's a long tradition in the history of the church about how to interpret this. But I think first, we have to ask, most basically, if it could mean, and almost everywhere else does mean, indignant, stern, angry, why would he be indignant in this moment? Is he indignant with Mary or Martha? Is he indignant with the mourners, some of whom may have been professionals hired for the purpose, who are in the crowd? Maybe, but I don't think so. There's not much indication in the text that that would be the case. We've just been told that he's weeping. He's weeping. But the moment of his indignation comes when he sees Mary and the others weeping together. What does this mean? This is the man who has just said in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. I wrote it in capital letters because you have to. I am the resurrection and the life. Martha says... Well, let's back up. Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise again. We know what, he's mean, what he means because we've read this passage before. Martha doesn't know what he means. Martha says, I know he will rise again at the end of all things, at the final resurrection. That's a good, sound, faithful answer. We shouldn't despise her for giving it. You should hope that you could be, that you could have that presence of mind at such a moment. I know that he will rise again at the resurrection. I know it. And in response, he says, 
I am the resurrection and the life standing before you right now, embodied, incarnate. Neither she nor anybody else there understands initially. When he says, move away the stone, no one there understands why he gives this command. It's even suggested to him, maybe this is not a great idea. The body is well and truly dead, well and truly dead. It's decaying, it's decomposing. This man, Jesus, embodies enmity to death, opposition to death. He is the anti-death standing there in front of a tomb. He it is, his power it is, which in Revelation 20 is going to hurl death and Hades into the lake of fire forever. He will make an end of them. They are his enemies. One thinks of John Donne's poetic line, death, thou shalt die. This is who it is who's standing in front of the grave. John Calvin is helpful here to condition us to understand what's happening. Christ does not approach the tomb as an idle spectator, but as a champion prepared for a contest. For the violent tyranny of death, which he had to conquer, is placed right before his eyes. And he is indignant but he is not alone. With his words, with his prayer, he invites us into the intimacy he has with his Father in this moment, in this great and magnificent moment. He says, Father, thank you that you have heard my prayer. I don't need to acknowledge this aloud, but for these people standing here, which also is us reading this text, I say these things. The Creator, His presence is here, God the Father. The Son, the enemy of death and all it stands for, is here, is present. To Mary and Martha, it's too late because they do not yet fully understand who He is. Here I think is the best reading of this passage. Christ is indignant with death, with loss, with everything that is wrong with this situation that he sees when he looks at Mary and her tear-streaked face and all of her friends and relations bowed to the ground with a weight of sorrow. He is indignant. If we prefer to say deeply moved, I think that's all right too. We still have to explain the source of this emotion. Some of it is sorrow. There are some people who try to explain this away and say, well, Jesus wasn't weeping for Lazarus because he knew Lazarus, Lazarus was going to be raised. Well, that seems illogical. I think there's some discomfort here with Jesus' humanity and a desire to explain away his sorrow. Lazarus was his friend. When he gets the letter from Bethany, it says, the one whom you love. I think Mary and Martha were in a position to know that Jesus loved Lazarus and was his friend. Sorrow is present here. Even if Christ is indignant with or deeply moved by some excess, some element of despair in the mourning of Mary and those who are with her, I think it's unreasonable to think that he is harshly rebuking them here through his emotions. First of all, because he doesn't rebuke them verbally. Secondly, because his weeping argues against it. And finally, because of Hebrews 4.15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. That's true of many things in our lives. Certainly it's true of the disordering 
dismembering power of death when it acts on us. We're not even united in our minds and in our hearts when we experience it. He's not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, and he does. He is indignant with death. But we might object and say, isn't death what all of us deserve, actually? Didn't we just say death is God's just merited curse on Adam and Eve and all of their race because of their sin, which you and I inherit and then perpetuate with our own actions? Yes. Yes, that's all true. But remember this, the consistent biblical pattern is that even those forces of judgment which God uses as his instruments of justice are themselves subject to judgment. If you, you could just literally pick any chapter in the prophets, major or minor, and you will learn this lesson. Woe to you, Edom, Babylon, you took advantage of my people and destroyed them. Wasn't that at God's command? Yes, it was, for their discipline, for their judgment. But woe to you who have so eagerly gone about the business. That's the pattern in the scriptures. I will quote for you just one passage from one of the prophets from the first chapter of Nahum of how God feels, God the Father in this passage, about the enemies of his people. And we're gonna see that Christ in this moment in Bethany is exactly in sync with the will and the nature of his Father. Here's what the prophet says in Nahum, chapter one, verses six to eight, about the enemies of his people. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. Now hear this pivot. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and he will pursue his enemies into darkness. That's the wrath of God against those who make victims and sport of his people. James 4, 5 tells us, God yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. It belongs to him and to no one else. But I think to interpret more deeply this passage and all it has to tell us, we can just go back to the beginning of the Gospel of John. And by the way, this works for basically anything that you might care to read in the Gospel of John. Go back to the first five verses, and it will be framed in its full significance for you. Hear these words again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The deep darkness of loss has not overcome, will not overcome, cannot overcome the light and the life of our Savior, the Son of God. Behold him standing here in front of the tomb. He cries out. He raises his voice with a great voice. He says this, Lazarus, come out. Who could this be but the Word of God? He doesn't need to touch him. He doesn't even need to approach the tomb. He simply speaks. This is the one whom the winds and waves obey. So will a decaying corpse. 
This is glorious. This is glorious beyond our ability to fully grasp or imagine. This is our hero and our savior confronting face to face a horror which we on our best days can barely name. Can you face death and meet it eye to eye? Can you look into the pale and empty gaze of a loved one who has died without trembling, without fear in the mystery that confronts you. We know what death is. We do, know, we do not know what it feels like to die. And until we die, we rest on faith. That faith is firmly founded but it is more than we can bear to look loss, to look the king of terrors in the face without flinching. But this is where the Son of God does it for us because he is life incarnate and he is the anti-death. It has often been remarked that it's a good thing Jesus specifies only Lazarus when he says, come out, lest every tomb in the earth and on the ocean and in every part of God's world should spontaneously yield its dead in obedience to the voice of the Son of God. That's when the Word of God speaks, who made the world, who may as well undo death all in one moment when he chooses. But on this occasion, he says, Lazarus, come out. And what does John write? Not Lazarus came out. The man who had died, the man who had died came out. What? The man who had died previously four days previously, came out. This is like the breath of God in the lungs of Adam in the beginning, reversing the course of all that mankind has suffered from this curse, bringing man back out of exile into the presence of his God. That is what you're watching unfold in front of you. And we should be tempted to say, there is no moment that compares to this in the Gospel of John. The reason we don't, though, is because greater things are ahead in this Gospel. Easter morning is ahead. The Son of God will need no one to unbind him. The reality for us is that loss, loss is a great boon to us, or it could be because it's a threat to our enemy's plans against us. It may plunge us into despair, yes, but it very often also compels us to call upon God. Our enemy knows this, he's wily, so he tries two different strategies with us. He tries to make us forget loss by numbing us with pleasures and distractions. Pleasures and distractions, which like a narcotic, take the feeling away. His other strategy, because unfortunately the world is such a messed up place that those pleasures, those distractions, are often punctured by real pain. You can't help it. You can lie in your bed and watch Netflix 24 hours a day, but eventually you'll be sick. Well, you'll be fit, you'll be sick rather faster if that's how you try to avoid life around you. And your body will compel you to face your own weakness and failure. The enemy has a plan for that too, though. He pushes us toward defiance. Dylan Thomas, the poet, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. How heroic. How noble. Set your face against all the pride and pomp of death. Show that you are still prouder. Plays right into our enemy's hands. 
It's brilliant. Because you lose, you die, your raging is of no consequence whatsoever. Our enemy knows it. Many people have not realized it. If not defiance, then desperation. Live every day like it's your last. You know, this is the wise advice of every wise pagan going back to the beginning of time. I know it. In my Latin class, we read Seneca. Seneca says, you're dying every day. We err in thinking that death is a future thing. All the time that's already passed in your life already belongs to death. And what is the logical consequence which flows from that attitude? Like a miser with your money, hoard and grasp until your palms are bloody every little coin that you have, every last coin. It's yours. Do not squander it. But your time is being ripped out of your hands day by day. You can't stop your progress towards death at the end of your life. This sounds noble, but it's not how Christians are to live. Which of these lies are you tempted to believe? Are you happily drowsing in a false dream? In the narcotic haze of distraction and pleasures, physical or otherwise? Or has life taught you, has suffering taught you to be frantic, to avoid any kind of loss at all? We have to face this. Ecclesiastes 7, 2 to 4, this is the end of all mankind, death, and the living will lay it to heart. Or Psalm 90, Moses, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Not only, though, that we may live wisely with a healthy appreciation of our limits and the fact that we don't have forever here on earth as it is. There are certain things you can only do now, can only preach the gospel now on this planet as it is, because no one's going to need it in the new heavens and the earth, obviously. You can only bathe the wounds of the poor that you find by the side of the road here now in the world as it is. The message for us is don't be the miser hanging on to every coin. Spend like the profligate because you cannot exhaust the treasury of heaven. You cannot exhaust yourself to no purpose in serving the poor, preaching the gospel, and doing good works because all of that is, as it were, backed up in the cloud. Apply this from William Gurnall, 17th century preacher. Don't run from the thought of death. Neither should you glory in it as some kind of Hollywood last stand for you and your pride. Instead, he says, make the thought of the evil day of your death, and we might add, or of your spouse's death, or of your child's death, of your grandpa's death, of your friend's death, 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 any kind of death, Make the thought of that day familiar to your soul. Handle that serpent often. Walk daily in serious meditation on it. Do not run from such thoughts because they are displeasing to your flesh. That is the sure way to increase the terror of them. Do with your souls when they are scared with the thoughts of affliction or death as you do with a horse that bolts and bucks as you ride on him. When he rears up and is startled by a thing, you don't yield to his fear and go back. That will make him worse the next time. You ride him up close to that which he is afraid of, and in time you break him of that quality. Bring up your heart close to death and show your soul what Christ has done to take the sting out of it because he is the anti-death. He is life with a capital L. All of it, every atom of it, flows out of his very being. And remember this hope beyond hope expressed with such magnificent courage by Job in the very teeth of his suffering. 
I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the dust. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Here's the point. The Son of God has done battle with death on your behalf, not from a distance, face to face, where it could be smelled. In his presence, and actually only in his presence, you can face every loss fully, without evasion, and without cowardice, with clear eyes that invent no fictions, that imbibe no narcotics, and a courageous heart. Etched in granite on my grandfather's headstone, which he shares with my grand grandmother, is this inscription. I just found this out yesterday. Because I, I haven't been there. I've been away for a while. I had forgotten. This is what it says in German. Ich weiß, dass mein Erloser lebt. I know that my Redeemer lives. That's the song that was on his lips when he died. His Savior heard him, came for him. He's with him now for life everlasting. As Magdalena Luther's coffin was being prepared for burial, there were carpenters hammering the last nails through its lid. And Luther is said to have cried out, hammer away, on doomsday she'll rise again. Let's pray. Father, we're so weak. We are totally swamped when loss overtakes us, capsizes everything we've ever known or understood about our lives here. Every comfort, everything we can hold on to for peace and stability. And we're cowards. We run in terror, left to ourselves from the face of death. We do not have the courage or the strength to face it face to face. But you did. Your son stood before the tomb. He cried out and the dead man came out. And he was indignant with the powers of death and loss that ravaged the lives of his people. Not only his people, but all of mankind. He was indignant in the face of his enemy whom he will hurl into the lake of fire. Give us courage when we look at him and let us feel and know his presence in the dark and dangerous day of our loss. Let us feel him near, see his power, and take heart. Amen.